Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Chapter 26 Israel Hands The wind, serving us to a desire, now hauled into the west. We could run so much easier from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only, as we had no power to anchor, and dared not beach her until the tide had flowed a good deal farther, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship to. After a good many trials I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal. Captain said he, at length, with that same uncomfortable smile, "'Ere's my old shipmate O'Brien. Suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't particular as a rule, and I don't take no blame for settling his hash. But I don't reckon him ornamental now, do you?' "'I'm not strong enough, and I don't like the job. And there he lies for me,' said I. "'He is an unlucky ship, the Hispaniola, Jim,' he went on, blinking. "'There's a power of men been killed on this Hispaniola, a sight of poor seamen dead and gone since you and me took this ship to Bristol. I never seen such dirty luck, not I. There was this here O'Brien now. He's dead, ain't he? Well, now, I'm no scholar, and you're a lad as can read and figure. And, to put it straight, do you take it as a dead man is dead for good, or do he come alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hands, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien there is in another world, and may be watching us. Ah, says he, well, that's unfortunate. Appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. Howsomever, spirits don't reckon for much by what I've seen. I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now you spoke up free, and I'll take it kind if you'll step down into that there cabin and get me a well, a shiver my timbers, I can't hit the name on't. Well, you can get me a bottle of wine, Jim. This here brandy's too strong for my head. Now the coxswain's hesitation seemed to be unnatural, and, as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck. So much was plain, but with what purpose I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro, up and down, now with a look to the sky, now with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien. All the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in a most guilty, embarrassed manner, so that a child could have told that he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay, and that, with a fellow so densely stupid, I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end. "'Some wine?' I said. "'Far better. Will you have white or red?' "'Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, shipmate,' he replied. "'So it's strong, and plenty of it. What's the odds?' "'All right,' I answered. "'I'll bring you port, Mr. Hands, but I'll have to dig for it.' And with that I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the sparred gallery, mounted the forecastle ladder, and popped my head out of the fore companion. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible, and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. He had risen from his position to his hands and knees and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply when he moved, for I could hear him stifle a groan, yet it was at a good rattling rate that he trailed himself across the deck. In half a minute he had reached the port scuppers, and picked up a coil of rope with a long knife, or rather a short dirk, discoloured to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his under jaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then hastily concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trundled back again into his old place against the bulwark. This was all that I required to know. Israel could move about. He was now armed, 
and if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. What would he do afterward? Whether he would try to crawl right across the island from North Inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether he would fire Long Tom, trusting that his own comrades might first come to help him, was, of course, more than I could say. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point— since in that our interests jumped together, and that was the disposition of the schooner. We both desired to have her stranded safe enough, in a sheltered place, so that when the time came she could be got off again, with as little labour and danger as might be, and until that was done I considered that my life would certainly be spared. While I was thus turning the business over in my mind I had not been idle with my body. I had stolen back to the cabin, slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine, and now, with this for an excuse, I made my reappearance on the deck. Hands lay as I had left him, all fallen together in a bundle, and with his eyelids lowered, as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked up, however, at my coming, knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who had done the same thing often, and took a good swig, with his favourite toast of is luck. Then he lay quiet for a little, and then, pulling out a stick of tobacco, begged me to cut him a quid. "'Cut me a junk of that,' says he, "'for I haven't no knife, and hardly the strength enough, so be as I had. Ah, oh, Jim, Jim, I reckon I've missed stays. Cut me a quid as likely to be the last, lad, for I'm for my long home, and no mistake.' "'Well,' said I, "'I'll cut you some tobacco, but if I was you and thought myself so badly, I would go to my prayers like a Christian man.' "'Why?' said he. "'Now you tell me why.' "'Why?' I cried. "'You were asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet this very moment, and you ask me why?' "'For God's mercy, Mr. Hands, that's why.' I spoke with a little heat, thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket, and designed, in his ill thoughts, to end me with. He, for his part, took a great draught of the wine, and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. "'For thirty year,' he said, "'I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad, better and worse.' fair weather and foul provisions running out knives going and what not well now i tell you i never seen good come out of goodness yet him as strikes first is my fancy dead men don't bite them's my views amen so be it and now you look here he added suddenly changing his tone "'We've had enough of this foolery. The tide's made good enough by now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail slap in and be done with it.' All told, we had scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this northern anchorage was not only narrow and shoal, but lay east and west, so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in. I think I was a good prompt subaltern, and I am sure that Hans was an excellent pilot, for we went about and about, and dodged in, shaving the banks, with a certainty and a neatness that were a pleasure to behold. Scarcely had we passed the head before the land closed around us. The shores of North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of the southern anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower, and more like what in truth it was the estuary of a river. Right before us, at the southern end, we saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about with great webs of dripping seaweed, and on the decks of it shore bushes had taken root, and now flourished thick with flowers. It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. Now— said Hans. "'Look there. There's a pet bit for to beach a ship in. Fine flat sand. Never a cat's paw. 
trees all around of it, and flowers are blowing like a garden on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired, how shall we get her off again? Why so, he replied. You take a line ashore there on the other side at low water, take a turn about one of them big pines, bring it back, take a turn around the capstan, and lie to for the tide. Come high water, all hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes as sweet as nature. And now, boy, you stand by. We've hit the bit now, and she's too much way on her. Starboard a little. So, steady, starboard. Larboard a little. Steady, steady. So he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed, till, all of a sudden, he cried, "'Now, my hearty, laugh!' And I put the helm hard up, and the Hispaniola swung round rapidly, and ran stem on for the low wooded shore. The excitement of these last manoeuvres had somewhat interfered with the watch I had kept hitherto sharply enough upon the coxswain. Even then I was still so much interested, waiting for the ship to touch, that I had quite forgotten the peril that hung over my head, and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks, and watching the ripples spreading wide before the bows. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life, had not a sudden disquietude seized upon me, and made me turn my head. Perhaps I had heard a creak, or seen his shadow moving with the tail of my eye. Perhaps it was an instinct, like a cat's. But sure enough, when I looked round, there was Hans, already half-way toward me, with the dirk in his right hand. We must both have cried out aloud when our eyes met. But while mine was the shrill cry of terror, his was a roar of fury like a charging bull's. At the same instant he threw himself forward, and I leapt sideways toward the bows. As I did so I let go of the tiller, which sprung sharp to leeward, and I think this saved my life, for it struck hands across the chest, and stopped him for the moment dead. Before he could recover I was safe out of the corner where he had me trapped, with all the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the mainmast I stopped, drew a pistol from my pocket, took a cool aim, though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me, and drew the trigger. The hammer fell, but there followed neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with sea-water. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had I not, long before, reprimed and reloaded my only weapons? Then I should not have been as now, a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher. Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move, his grizzled hair tumbling over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign with his haste and fury. I had no time to try my other pistol, nor indeed much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. One thing I saw plainly, I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily hold me boxed in the bows, as a moment since he had so neatly boxed me in the stern. Once so caught, and nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the mainmast, which was of a goodish bigness, and waited every nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in feints on his part, and corresponding movements upon mine. It was such a game as I had often played at home, about the rocks of Black Hill Cove, but never before, you may be sure, with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, as I say it, it was a boy's game, and I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had began to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair, and while I saw certainly that I could spin it out for long, I saw no hope in any ultimate escape. Well, while things stood thus, suddenly the Hispaniola struck, staggered, ground for an instant in the sand, and then, swift as a blow, canted over to the port side, till the deck stood at an angle of forty-five degrees, and about a puncheon of water splashed into the scupper-holes, and lay in a pool between the deck and the bulwark. 
We were both of us capsized in a second, and both of us rolled almost together into the scuppers, the dead red cap with his arms still spread out, tumbling stiffly after us. So near were we, indeed, that my head came against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all, I was the first afoot again, for hands had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canting of the ship had made the deck no place for running on. I had found some new way of escape, and that upon the instant, for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not draw a breath till I was seated on the cross trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The dirk had struck not half a foot below me as I pursued my upward flight, and there stood Israel Hands with his mouth open and his face upturned to mine, a perfect statue of surprise and disappointment. Now that I had a moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol, and then, having one ready for service, and to make assurance doubly sure, I proceeded to draw the load of the other, and recharge it afresh from the beginning. My new employment struck hands all of a heap. He began to see the dice going against him, and, after an obvious hesitation, he also hauled himself heavily into the shrouds, and, with the dirk in his teeth, began slowly and painfully to mount. It cost him no end of time and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him, and I had quietly finished my arrangements before he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. "'One more step, Mr. Hands,' said I, "'and I'll blow your brains out. Dead men don't bite, you know,' I added, with a chuckle. He stopped instantly. I could see by the workings of his face that he was trying to think, and the process was so slow and laborious that, in my new-found security, I laughed out loud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke, his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. In order to speak he had to take the dagger from his mouth, but, in all else, he remained unmoved. "'Jim,' says he, "'I reckon we're fouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you but for that there lurch. But I don't have no luck, not I, and I reckon I'll have to strike, which comes hard, you see, for a master mariner to a ship's yunker like you, Jim.' I was drinking in his words, and smiling away, as conceited as a cock upon a walk, when all in a breath back went his right hand over his shoulder. Something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow, and then a sharp pang, and there I was, pinned by the shoulder to the mast. In the horrid pain and surprise of the moment, I scarce can say it was by my own volition, and I am sure it was without a conscious aim. Both of my pistols went off, and both escaped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry the coxswain loosed his grasp upon the shrouds, and plunged head first into the water. End of chapter 26